Hello and welcome to Independent Thinking, the weekly podcast from Chatham House. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, the director. This week, we're talking about one question. Is Rory Stewart right about Britain and about populism? This week, Chatham House hosted former minister, former MP Rory Stewart, to discuss the dangers of populism and the state of the UK's politics. A former deputy governor in Iraq in 2003, who famously walked across Afghanistan and is now an acclaimed podcaster, Roy Stewart's latest book on his time as an MP has created a storm with its criticism of the British political system. I spoke to him on the Chatham House stage and I asked him about his time as an MP and a minister and what he saw from inside the British government about why it works and why it doesn't. Let's start with this book, as I said. We are going indeed to come on to global politics and, and populism. But um, I was very struck, as, as you can see from the, the, uh, the tags I've put in it, about your experience of being a politician and being a minister, and wondered whether you thought it was worth being an MP without being a minister. Well, well th- firstly, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, I think that being a backbench MP is a very, very peculiar job in the modern age. Uh, You represent a constituency, but you don't have any legal power over that constituency. You have no budget in relation to that constituency. So there is a sort of element of bad faith from the very beginning, which is that you are campaigning by pretending to your constituents that you're going to be able to sort out the potholes, deal with the planning which of course is the job of the local council, or you're claiming that you're going to be able to duel the A66, which is the job of the Secretary of State for Transport, and you may not actually, your party may not even be in government. You then are sent off to do something that none of your constituents are very interested in, which is to vote on legislation in Parliament. But in voting on legislation in Parliament, of course, 98% of the time, you are not exercising your own judgment in any way at all. This is a party system that is run on a running, perpetual three-line whip. Uh, the, initially, this idea of a three-line whip suggested there were differences between one, two, and three-line whips. We now operate almost entirely on three-line whips. And great rebels, you know, the sort of people like Jacob Rees-Mogg will perhaps rebel two or three times a year. A significant uh, rebel like me, I I blighted my career by rebelling once and was then not promoted for the next four years uh, in punishment. People like Michael Gove, successful Secretaries of State, have never voted against a piece of government legislation ever in their careers since 2005. And there is a good constitutional argument why that should be the case. In other words, you vote for a party, you expect your party to carry through its manifesto. You're not very amused. Let's say you voted for the Labour Party and your local Labour MP started voting against um, Keir Starmer's policy on education. You might well be a bit resentful. Uh, In fact, there's an argument from Burke in the 18th century that if you allow people to rebel against their party whips, it actually creates a form of corruption. Regardless of the arguments one way or the other, the fact is that you are lobby fodder. And you are lobby fodder at an even more extreme level when you become a minister, when it is actually a constitutional rule that if you ever vote once against the government, you have to resign from your ministerial position. So by definition, any minister in the government is never doing it. So you're powerless in your constituency. You have no autonomy, really, in Westminster. What are you then doing? And to uh, get a sense of that, it's worth seeing the valedictory speeches of members of parliament, people who've served 25, 30 years giving speeches, and they're quite interesting. I sat through a a group as I was leaving myself. There was a Labour MP from from Wales whose greatest achievement, she remembers, was going down a coal mine for three and a half days in solidarity with miners in the early 1980s, on the basis of which she felt she contributed in a small way to keeping the mine open for another 10 years. But of course, it was then closed in 1993, and she was stepping down in 2019. Uh, Other people talked about getting a lift installed at their local railway station. This is the culmination of 25 years of of career in the House of Commons. Um, uh, So worth worth looking at. And and others didn't even attempt to point to particular achievements if they'd been backbenchers all their lives. They instead paid tribute to the the catering staff, to the staff that worked in their parliamentary office, and to their loyal constituency activists. 
Um, so it's it's a very it's a very um, it's a very unusual job. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that, and I'm going to take that as a version of of, of no, uh, in that for all the um, work that constituency MPs do admirably, as you said, they don't end up with a long list. I, I'm also taking this in a way as your valedictory speech, but I'm really interested in the way you talk about reaching over the heads of all of this machinery to uh, to the public, and whether you felt that that, in a way, was the future of politics. Because this is one of the subjects we're talking about here today, of the, the different forces that have pushed politics, not just in this country, but towards a kind of populism. Well, I think that's a really, I mean, I think that's a really difficult, challenging question. <laughs> I mean, I am, you know, ferociously anti-populist, and I would have liked to come today and largely spend most of my time attacking Suella Braverman, who I think is a, a terrible, terrible person, and I think a, a, an example. Um, sorry, I'm not trying to get cheap applause, but I, um, but I do think there is something deeply, deeply worrying and troubling in Europe and the United States, and indeed around the world, which has happened since about 2014, which is the development of this populist politics. And this populist politics is terrifying. Uh, it's simplifying, it's polarizing, it creates this narrative of the people against the elite. In Germany, AFD is hovering between 20 and 25% in the polls. Marine Le Pen looks as though she is likely to be the next president of France, and that is a much bigger problem than, than Giorgio Maloney being the prime minister of Italy. Uh, we can see significant problems in Sweden, in the Nordic countries, and you can feel it in the Conservative Party conference at the moment. Right? It's, it's absolutely astonishing. These people, Priti Patel, Liz Truss, were brought in on the A-list by David Cameron. They were supposed to be the signs of the new liberal progressive compassionate conservative party. Suella Braverman uh, was uh, you know, a, an Erasmus scholar who spent two years studying in Europe, passed the New York bar exam, set up with Cherie Blair of all people, the Africa Justice Foundation in 2010, made you know, grand speeches. You can see articles in the Times about you know, the rule of law and the importance of uh, parliamentary democracy in Africa. So the fact that those people have gone from 2010 to where they are now right, is not actually about them. It's about the fact that these are political entrepreneurs sensing a whole new range of possibilities. And what, what, what are they sensing? This is what I would love your views are. Are, are they sensing a change in what the public wants? Um, a new kind of public anxiety, with, you know, talks about you know, public anger, about, about the financial crisis, about the elites, um, is a response to an impossible job of politics, of a country that, in this case, doesn't have enough money to complete a train line and, uh, and so on, um, and so they have to offer something. Where do you, where do you see it coming? Because I, I find it very, when people say, oh, it's all social media or something, that feels to me not doing enough justice to either the appetite of people to hear particular things or the appetite of politicians to say them? Well, I, th I think the honest answer is we, we haven't fully got a grip on what this thing is, because once it takes on a life of its own, it has a sort of imponderable unpredictability and momentum to it. I mean, I can provide a narrative. I, my view is that the period from uh, 1989 to 2004, the sort of Fukuyama end of history, notion was based upon five assumptions which were then broken from 2004 to 2014 and uh, ushered in the age of populism and those assumptions were firstly an idea that markets deregulation globalization were going to create uh, prosperity for all the second assumption was that that prosperity was going to lead to a spread of global democracy the third assumption was that this corresponded with the emergence of a liberal global order the first assumption, fourth assumption was that our societies were inherently legitimate, Western societies were inherently legitimate, they had a form of moral uh, strength. And the fifth assumption was that politics was a question of technocracy in the centre ground. And this was destroyed, right? It was destroyed. The 2008 financial crisis destroyed our economic assumptions. The link between prosperity and democracy was destroyed effectively by the rise of China. It became bigger than the British economy. In, as recently as 2005. 
you know, when Jeremy Greenstock and I were in Iraq, which doesn't feel very long ago, the British economy was bigger than the Chinese economy. Today, the Chinese economy is nearly six times larger than the British economy. And of course, it's made that transition without becoming a liberal democracy. The idea of the liberal global order were, was destroyed by the humiliations and messes of Iraq and Afghanistan above all. Social media, I think, tore us apart in terms of the idea of consensus, created that polarization. And I think the legitimacy of our own system has been challenged by a whole series of civil social movements in the United States and Europe, which has begun to make us feel profoundly ashamed of our own history and our own identity in ways that were not true in the 1990s. Cumulatively, those things you can then see play through. The number of democracies in the world ceases, having doubled. 1988 to 2004, number of democracies in the world double, then flat lines, and it then begins to drop. From 2014 onwards, the world becomes pretty much more violent every year. There are more refugees every year, more civilians killed in conflict every year. We've had seven states in Africa go through military coups in just over a year now. And this is the world that produces Modi in 2014, the Law and Justice Party in Poland in 2015, the Brexit referendum in 2016, Bolsonaro in 2018, Trump in 2016. So now there are other things too, though, which are less comfortable. And clearly one of those things is immigration. Right? A lot of Suella Braverman's speech is not just about woke wars and following up on 15 minute cities and climate skepticism and all this kind of stuff, although that's part of the package. The main driver of that speech is, of course, immigration. The main driver of the far right in Sweden is immigration and the idea that the crime, amazing spike in crime in Sweden that we've seen over the last three years is associated with immigrants. Uh, that is true almost everywhere, in fact, except to some extent Spain and Portugal, where the immigrant issue doesn't seem to be felt in quite the same way. Um, so that's part of it. But I think another part of it, which Brahman's pointing to, which is maybe a more fertile, interesting idea, is there's also a sense of sclerosis, stagnation, lack of progress. I mean, I, I felt all the time as a politician, one of the biggest problems was the surreal gap between the expectations of the public, fueled by politicians who keep claiming they can do things that they can't do. I mean, right the way down to what I began with, the constituency MP claiming they're going to be able to fix their potholes when they quite literally have no power over your potholes at all and are therefore going to disappoint you right, about your potholes. Um, right the way up to the uh, health secretary who claims that he's going to be able to sort out the NHS when quite clearly the system is far too big, far too complicated, far too creaking for any one individual to begin to pretend that they're going to have any impact on in a 24-month period. Right? I mean, I could do things, but the things that I did in government are not of that scale. I introduced the plastic bag tax. <laughs> You know, I reduced violence in prisons. I doubled the expense we spent on climate and environment. What I did not do is any of the things that really needed to be done, right? I did not succeed in rebalancing this country in terms of addressing the inequality within London or the inequality between London and the southeast and the north of this country. We did not manage to change the way we make industrial investments to take into account social justice or the environment. We did not succeed in increasing productivity in Britain, which is lamentable. We did not manage to transform the education system. And we have handed over an education and health system into which more and more money is going. Right? You wouldn't believe it because the assumption is that the problem is that the Tories are the austerity Tories. Since Boris Johnson, the Conservative Party, actually since Theresa May, has been spending money like water, throwing money at these situations. You know, Theresa May's first big thing was to deliver this notorious 300 million on the side of the bus. You know, she delivered the 300 million a day on the side of the bus to the NHS, made no difference at all. Boris Johnson came in, put another 5 billion into the NHS, made no difference at all. Rishi Sunak has just announced an NHS transformation plan two months ago which within 10 years is going to cost, that alone, that plan alone, will cost 3% of the gross domestic product of this country. That is 50% more than the entire defense budget of the United Kingdom. It's unlikely to make any difference. 
Health inflation, because of demography and the cost of drugs, exceeds normal inflation by about 5% a year. The country is much poorer than we want to acknowledge. And nobody is structurally addressing these problems. Um, and the public sense it. And this is the problem. The populists are entirely right in their identification that there are deep, deep problems, that the economic model we promised in the 1990s didn't deliver, the democratic model we promised didn't deliver, the liberal global order we promised didn't deliver. They are correct about all those things. What they're wrong about is the solutions that they offer. Listening to you, I'm wondering whether you think democracies can still solve their own problems. It's something we talk quite a bit about at Chatham House. That was Rory Stewart speaking with me on the Chatham House stage. Now, earlier this week, I was up in Manchester for the Conservative Party conference, which we referred to in our discussion, and I spoke to ITV's Robert Peston about what he makes about Rory Stewart's savage criticism of the British political system. Here's how our discussion went. Rory Stewart's written this book, Politics on the Edge, but it could have been entitled On the Edge of Politics. And the thing that you're bound to conclude reading it um, is that he, he, for some people, is going to be the, their favourite kind of politician. And for others, he's going to be idealistic to a fault, very hard to get anything done. What did you make of him? I mean, I really liked engaging with him uh, when he was in the government because he did try to answer questions and I'm afraid we live in an era when most ministers just do their best not to engage. Um, he's also very bright uh, and quite imaginative so I thought he was a, a loss to Parliament. He got a lot done at the prisons minister, he stayed there longer than he had to have done, but he describes this, he makes this savage attack on the system that doesn't really work, civil servants not trying to get things done, agencies getting in the way. Do you think that rings true? Look, there's bureaucracy all over the public service, um, and uh, normally, in my experience, when somebody says the machine is creaking, uh, and you look at it, it turns out to be even worse. Uh, so I do have some sympathy with that view. Um, I don't know enough about the state of the prison service at that time. I do know now that it is absolutely a priority to look at penal reform and also invest in uh, the prison estate. Uh, it, it, you know, the, the mess is appalling. Last point. He writes beautifully the way most politicians don't. He says about Boris, you look it up, he says um, uh, the air of roguish solidity was undermined by the furtive cunning of his eyes, which made it seem as though an alien creature had possessed his reassuring body and was squinting out of the sockets. Do we need a lot more of that for people to understand politics, or is that <laughs> colouring up, it up too much? So, Rory's going to hate this. Um, I take the view that he has way more in common with Boris Johnson than he would ever like to admit. Um, they both have extraordinary confidence in their own abilities. That was ITV's Robert Peston speaking with me at the Conservative Party conference in Manchester earlier this week. Now, joining me in the studio to discuss what Rory Stewart had to say here at Chatham House are my guests and colleagues. Roxanne Escobales is the brilliant editor of our magazine, The World Today, and she's currently reviewing Rory Stewart's book for the magazine. Welcome back to the podcast, Roxanne. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to have you here. I saw when you were going up in the lift, was it one or two copies of the book you had? Oh, just one. Just and one. That was, that's the world's um, slowest lift, I think. It is, it is. It's not quite enough time to read the book, though. Joining us as well is Olivia O'Sullivan, who is the director of our UK in the World programme and was with me in the Conservative Party conference as well. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here and well done for getting back from Manchester. It's not the easiest task, a week of train strikes. Roxanne, what did you make of Rory Stewart's description of trying to be a good MP and then a minister? Um, I found it really interesting. You know, I don't think... Uh, Rory Stewart was meant to be an MP or a minister. I think his real calling is to be a CEO, really. Um, he is very solutions-oriented um, and values knowledge. Um, what he 
doesn't seem to be able to do, uh, which politicians must be able to do, is to sort of um, do the soundbite and pander to uh, more popular slogans, and which, as we know, is, is not something he actually values. Because we were talking about populism as well as British politics. You're saying it was um, creating a division between elites and the people and saying the people have the, you know, the real views. Did you feel that he was capturing something that is um, really stuck or broken about British politics at the moment? I think it, it, it goes beyond British politics and into the actual machinery of government um, and how that's set up and the sort of revolving door of ministerial, uh, ministerial appointments, um, as well as perhaps, uh, civil service that's perhaps um, overtaxed and I would say maybe even um, a bit over all the ministerial uh, uh, revolving door. Uh, sorry, let me start over again. Um, but also a civil service that is perhaps um, uh, has grown a bit cynical um, over how many ministers they've had to work with, a bit um, kind of thick of it, um, if you will. If you don't know what the thick of it is, it's a British uh, political satire that shows a sort of bumbling, um, bumbling ministers in uh, bumbling civil service. Um, now I know Olivia, you've worked in the civil service, so you might have a different view. But this is this is uh, the impression you get um, from reading the book, at least. Olivia, you were indeed a civil servant and you took Rory Stewart to task on this a bit about um, whether or not the system is not functioning in the way he described. What do you feel about it? Well, I think it's interesting, Roxanne, that you say Rory Stewart's calling might have been to be a CEO. I think his calling might have been to be a writer. I think he's a very good writer. He's um, The book is full of fascinating descriptions of people. It makes what could be quite a dry description of a political career really involving. And he's very acute about people and how they act. I think on the whole, though, that means it's an excellent description of the problem. He struggles a bit, to be fair, we all do, to find solutions, which is why I did ask him about the fact that everyone in British public life seems to feel somewhat powerless about the direction in which British public life is going. And I'm very curious about why that is, because surely somebody has power um, in our system. Um, I think the impression you get from Stuart's book is someone who arguably was in a position of immense power, but perhaps in institutions that are really struggling to manage the way modern power works. He seems to be someone who was bombarded by information and very short-term pulls on his attention, but struggled to get anything done. Um, and perhaps that is a reflection of what has been a time of significant change and tumult in British politics. He was in power at a time when, since the 2016 referendum, the UK has had four prime ministers and five foreign secretaries, many of whom had not been members of parliament for very long. Um, at a time when the UK is struggling with low productivity, um, struggling to find the resources available to have the role in the world that it seeks. So I think some of what he describes is, is a time of significant tumult and change. The question is whether that's a longer term trend or not. And it's true that as a civil servant, when the person in charge changes all the time, you too struggle to understand what you are seeking to achieve or what you're trying to get done. And one of the points he made is not just that ministers change very often. Uh, he, ch he was lucky to get a year in a job and many ministers, um, at least in these times, don't get even that. Um, but then is, he was sympathetic, in a sense, to civil servants being nervous about following the new direction in case it changes yet again. And we can see from the point of view of the permanent civil service, as it is, as it's described, that trying to find a line of continuity between all these changing policies we've just had this week at the Conservative Party uh, conference, the, the scrapping of the rest of, of HS2, it is extraordinarily hard. I think it is a very valuable um, tonic, the way he describes it, because often in the UK, we're quite um, proud of our institutions. And when we talk about ourselves in the world, we talk about them as very well functioning. Um, and he kind of underlines that perhaps for some time we've lacked the ability to think long term um, and lacked clarity about who is meant to be thinking long term about the UK's policies and interests in the world. Just to uh, pick up on what you said, Olivia, um, that the 
British are proud of their institutions, one gets the impression that uh, Rory Stewart is very proud of British institutions. And this is exactly why he laments at what he has encountered as the very poor quality of the operational side of these institutions um, as he is, you know, as he has experienced them in his time uh, in government and uh, in office. One of the solutions that he came down to, and Olivia um, and I uh, from the stage pressed him on this, were to try and develop his more positive points, if you like, after this searing critique. One of his positive points was to try to decentralise more, to give more power, for example, to mayors, and he ran as, as he ran to be mayor of London unsuccessfully. Roxanne, I, with your US perspective, do you think that uh, that is part of the answer? I mean, p- p- conceivably even a more federal system? To be honest, I, I couldn't say. Um, I mean, that's a really big question and that would be a whole systemic change. Um, Let me ask you a different, he, a, different, a different way then. You know, what, what is the best job in American politics? Is it to be a governor, a senator, where you can arguably get a, a bridge built? Um, or which other countries like Britain tend to look at an awful lot, the president, but arguably it's quite hard to get stuff done. Um, I think actually, uh, you know, in the States, I'm a real big fan of uh, local politics, having been a local reporter and, um, you know, seen a lot of city hall uh, meetings and also county uh, commission meetings. I find that um, on local level, uh, especially, there's a lot to be done. But saying that, I think governors in particular have a lot of power considering um, the the power that states have in relation to federal um, government. So you do have a lot of um, authority to say what gets spent on what programs as governor of a state. So, um, and then you can see that, you know, uh, with the rise of Bill Clinton uh, going up. Uh, he was governor of Arkansas, of course. Um, and the, go- and the, governors, probably... the governors have supplied quite a lot of presidents in their way. It's, it's a natural gradation in a way it wouldn't be from the Senate. Yeah. Ronald Reagan, also yeah. governor of California. Harder from the Senate, president. perhaps, arguably, to discuss the whole thesis in that. Olivia, what did you make of Roy Stewart's... Um, it's not quite a peon to mayors, but um, a, a belief in mayors, a belief in local government. I think it comes back to something I was saying earlier, which is that he is wonderful at describing the problem. And I think probably he himself would say struggles to name exactly what the solution would be. Of course, what he is describing is a really complex political landscape that many countries are facing where traditional institutions, centrist politics is struggling to deliver and people are turning to populism as a result. And it's unlikely there'll be one easy answer that you could give at a talk from a stage to that problem. Um, I think you do see all over the world, in my experience, that decentralization sometimes seems like an answer and you end up empowering local elites or you end up with unresponsive local institutions. Or you end up with corruption or lack of challenge to a government as we've seen in in, uh, in Scotland, arguably in the past few years. Yes. Um, and people having not having the sort of recourse to a, to a higher level of government sometimes to sort that out um, or a less local level of government to sort that out. So I think decentralisation is an, is an interesting partial answer, but everything he describes seems to be much more about how our institutions work rather than which institutions we empower. Um, so I think the direction is interesting. There's a sort of idea of radical rethinking of how our democracy works, but I think he could actually... I think focusing on how our institutions work rather than which institutions we empower would be an interesting direction to take that thought that he has. Roxanne, did you think this was a book about a failing system or a failed politician? (laughs) That's a very provocative question, Bronwyn. Um, I think it was a book about a failing system in the sense that he very much wants it to change. Um, As somebody, I don't know if you could call him a failed politician. I think he had a very successful career um, and can point to some successes he had um, as a politician. Although I think he is a politician that is probably not very good at politicking, um, which um, I don't think he values so much. I do think you come away 
with somebody who is um, very proud of his country and its institutions, as I said, but sort of in despair at the poor quality of standards that he's encountered. Um, but you do understand what his values are when you finish reading it. And uh, he mentioned a lot of them you know, in, in, uh, in his appearance tonight in Chatham House. Um, one around the progressive center, decentralization. He really values technocrats and people who have that sort of subject matter expertise um, and hands-on experience. Um, and he really um, is a supporter of democracy. So I kind of see this more as a sort of rallying cry for the progressive center to organize and, and mobilize and actually uh, renew this pride in the British uh, institutions of, of government um, as a way to improve them. If you're leading our work on Britain in the world, UK in the world, what do you think this kind of questioning, indeed challenging and criticism of um, Britain not working, not just from Rory Stewart, but many, many people at the moment, what does this do to Britain's image in the world? I think it's an interesting one because often in the programme, when we discuss the themes or questions that we want to focus on, we start by looking out at the world and thinking about what the UK can or should do. And we end up circling back to the functioning of our institutions at home. Maybe because we've been through a period of particular tumult, but maybe because there is a trend towards British institutions not functioning as well as they could. And enacting any kind of foreign policy of any level of ambition abroad requires the state's capacity to get things done. Um, so I think that this is a very valuable intervention in that discussion. I think there is something to be said for in order to have any kind of role in the world. You need to reflect on whether you're the institutions that you often champion and in some cases seek to... Um, encourage others to adopt or work with, um, you need to focus on whether they, they function at all. I mean, I think it's interesting because equally Rory Stewart is a person whose political career and life maybe was marked by, he talks about his father in the book as someone who's very competent and effective in a colonial administration. Um, he perhaps come from a gener comes from a generation of British politicians whose parents or specifically fathers were very, very powerful in the world. And we're not in that world anymore. Um, so I think quite a lot of the book is about power and who enacts it and whether we are able to anymore. But the questions about who has a right to enact it are a bit more complicated. Really interesting point you make. And there was a point in the conversation where he referred to the way the world seemed to run more smoothly when you had a lot of these men, as you say, uh, some with military backgrounds, many uh, talking to each other in a language that they understood. Roxanne, if I give you the final word on this, what do you think this kind of portrait, and again, we are talking in the week of the cancellation of part of HS2, that uh, ill-fated train line, what does this do to the image of Britain in the world? I think it speaks to um, something that goes actually beyond Britain, um, and that is uh, conservatism and Western conservatism. I think what we're seeing is, you know, this uh, conservative Tory party um, actually swinging to populist uh, right wing um, ideology um, to its own detriment. Um, you know, we, we all expect it to be voted out of power uh, next year and for Labour to come into power. And I think, you know, speaking to colleagues that, you know, will go into the wilderness and become actually irrelevant. But we're seeing a similar lurch, you know, in America as well, uh, with the ousting of the House um, uh, leader, uh, McCarthy, oh, what was his name, Ke sorry? Kevin McCarthy. With the ousting of um, the House leader, Kevin McCarthy, um, and, you know, Trumpist uh, base, uh, populist base, really taking a grip on the GOP. And what does that actually mean for Western conservatism now? It used to be a party of sort of reason and rationality. And it's uh, something that I hope to explore in the December, January issue of The World Today when we look at, you know, the, all the elections that are happening in 2024. 
um, the U.S. being you know, what probably arguably the most important. Um, I don't know. India and the, Indonesia the would both would both argue, and so would the U.K. <laughs> argue with that. Well, yeah. so yeah, but but looking at you know that yeah. Western yeah. conservatism and, and what does that actually mean? So I think you know this. This book, um, uh, what he does is sort of expose, you know, some of the personalities behind that and what that actually means internally for the institutions and what's at stake there. Well, thank you for that and for bringing in this question about conservatism right at the end. We, of course, are touching on themes that are central to Chatham House's work, including whether democracies can solve their own problems and the fortunes of uh, rival models to democracy, I should say, at Chatham House, that we allow for the possibility that the uh, that Labour does not win the next election. We are scrupulously even-handed. But we're going to have to stop there. More on all this to come. And as Roxanne was saying, a huge election year to come when we turn around the corner of the year. So for now, a big thank you to my guests, Roxanne Escobales and Olivia O'Sullivan, for joining us at the end of this podcast and week of many parts, but with some continuing themes about Britain's problems and a few of the answers and the wider questions about democracy. Do follow all our guests on Twitter. The links are in the show notes. And a reminder that you can find all of our podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or major platforms, as well as through our social media. So do like, follow, subscribe, and comment. To read more from all our people and to find out more about our many events or to become a member, we'd love to have you. Don't forget to visit chathamhouse.org and you can find there the work of the UK programme, the World Today's latest great issue on artificial intelligence and everything else, including this long conversation and lots of questions with Rory Stewart. Goodbye from me, Bronwyn Maddox. Thank you for listening. 